minutes. Okay, let's get to work. Now start, uh, starting chapter five. Probability distributions. I hope I can make it all the way to 5-5 five, five with Poisson, but that's an optional one. If we get there, great. If we don't, that's okay. And this is a pretty quick turnaround. Your next test is only a couple <coughs> weeks away. But we, before we just dive into things here, a pause to reflect of where we've been so far and how does this fit in the overall sequence. Because believe it or not, there is a method to the way the material is put together. And I think the author has it laid out very rationally. In the first three chapters, we talked about descriptive statistics. And you can think of it almost post-mortems. The data's been measured, it's collected. I've got a great big pile of it. How can I use graphs, charts, pictures, and statistics to describe what this means? But it's kind of a historical look at it, isn't it? The data's there. Well, chapter four, we studied the concept of probability and how to calculate it in a lot of different ways. And generally, when you're using probability, you, you want to make a prediction about the future. How likely is something going to happen to be? <coughs> it happen? Or in a slight twist of that, you might say, well, here's an outcome I observed. Is that a very likely outcome? Those questions are going to be really important, particularly in 5 and 6 and all through your career in 106, where we go into inferential statistics. And in inferential statistics, we really do the powerful, really important application of statistics that's out there in the real world all the time. Uh, when uh, Companies like Pfizer's do drug studies to see if a new medication actually works. Uh, what they're doing is inferential statistics. And they're looking at their data from their experiment and saying, how likely is this result to have occurred if my medication didn't work or if it did work? So this concept that we're introducing now, probability distributions, calculating probabilities, and seeing what's likely and what is unlikely, what's usual or what's unusual, is core to the mainstream of statistics. Used out there in the in industry, in the real world, all the time. As always, when we start a chapter, we've got lots of definitions and concepts to introduce. So this, that's going to be what it is mostly today. It's more terms. Start with big two are random variables and probability distributions. And we'll talk about two, two varieties of random variables, discrete and continuous. Then after we introduce that, we're going to focus in chapter five on just discrete random variables. In chapter six, we'll pick up continuous again, and then for the rest of your career, 105, 106, you'll be using continuous random variables. OK, so what is this thing called a random variable? Well, often in mathematics, we don't like, mathematicians don't like randomness, do we? We like things in all its gory detail. And we write expressions like y is equal to f of x equals x squared plus 10. And it's very deterministic. You give me an x, I'll tell you exactly what y is going to be. No questions asked. Let's go on to the next one, right? It's very convenient to have these kinds of expressions, these functions, because we can do so much with them. What we're doing in chapter five with this concept of random variable and probability distribution is we're trying to move away from the kind of techniques we used in four to something that's a little bit more like good old mathematics. But not quite, because here's the big difference. Where x here is a given, x now, the random variable, is, I can't tell you what it's going to be. I can tell you its permissible values. I can tell you what the probability is that it will have, and that it will take on a particular value. 
but I can't tell you in advance of my experiment or my procedure what the value is going to be. And that's the main idea and a huge difference from what we're used to doing in math to what we're doing now in, in probability distributions and random variables. So the key requirements of a random variable, there's two things. We're always going to be talking about numerical values, no exceptions. Up to now, the probability, we, we could go numerical values, we talked, we made lists of letters, we did things in a lot of different ways. From here on out, a random variable is always a numerical value, and it's determined by chance. That's all that's required. And a lot of the experiments or procedures we've talked about so far can easily be turned into a random variable. You're just looking at it in a slightly different way. Uh, rolling dice, we've done lots of examples calculating probability with dice. We made tables of outcomes or lists of possible outcomes to calculate probabilities. Well, here's how we're going to look at it now. We'll still have this procedure. I roll the pair of dice twice. My random variable has to be numerical value. It's going to be the total number of dots I saw are those two dice. <coughs> That's going to be anything from 2 to 12. I can't tell you in advance what number it will be. I can tell you it's between 2 and 12. And we can calculate probabilities that it will be one of those values. But I can't tell you what value it will be. Tossing a coin. We've done this a lot, haven't we? And often we did little strings of H's and T's and said, oh, that represents three tosses, a head, a tail, and a head. All right, we're going to move away from this kind of representation of a problem to that of a random variable, where I don't want to list out strings of possibilities. I want to use a numerical value to represent my outcome. So here I'd say, toss the coin three times. That's my procedure. My random variable is the number of heads number of heads and three tosses. Zero, one, two, or three. Think of uh, Mendel, the genetics experiment. Plant uh, pea seeds. Plant 100 of them, see how many have, what was he looking at, wrinkled skin versus yellow pods versus all of that. Perfect example of a random variable. I don't know what it's going to be in advance, but I can tell you the permitted values. The last three are a little bit different in the sense that they're measurements. The first three are counts, the second three are measurements. My procedure could be select one of you at random and measure your height. <coughs> I don't know that value, that height in advance, that's my random variable. I know the range of it, but I can't pre say precisely which value is going to occur. Temperature, we can talk about going to the steps of Mallory Hall and looking at the temperature at noon. Examples of random variables. And this chart makes it clear how we've shifted from chapter four, the probability, to now how we're looking at the same procedure. When we looked at this procedure, flip a coin three times. And remember how we list all the possible outcomes, all the H's and T's, and then calculate probabilities using those sets? All right, now I'm going to step back a bit and say, well, you know what? I'm interested in just the number of hits. I don't care about what order they came in. X is my random variable, the number of hits and three tosses, and it can be zero through three. And those numerical values are going to be useful now because I can do things with those and calculate statistics that I can't if I just had a string of three letters. And it's pretty obvious now that I can do some calculations in this example with probabilities. The probability that x is zero, that's no hits and three tosses. That's just one out of eight. The probability that it's equal to two, well, it's three out of eight. We calculated those probabilities before, didn't we, in chapter four? But we just didn't express it as a random variable. We just said the probability of three heads or two heads is three eighths. Same idea, just looking at it a little bit differently. 
Okay, now let's pause and before we go further, talk about the difference between discrete and continuous random variables. In chapter one, we were just beginning to think about collecting and studying data, and we made a distinction between discrete and continuous. Remember back then, discrete, usually a finite number of values. It doesn't have to be, but almost always finite. Often it's a count of something, so it's integer, often, but have to be. But the hallmark of discrete random variables are their gaps. It's not a, it's not a continuous scale. So if the uh, random variable is the number of emails you receive in a day, it's a count of something. That can be a really large number. You get 100 emails, you get 102, but you can't get 100.5. That's discrete random variable. <coughs> <coughs> continuous, but it's always an infinite number of values. You can't have a continuous random variable unless it has an uncountably infinite number of values. Think of a continuous scale. If I had a, a ruler up here, and I could with infinite precision pick out any little spot in that ruler, and between any two spots there's always another one, isn't there? There are no gaps. That's what we mean by continuous and no gaps. There's always between, no matter how close you are together, your two values, there's always more in between. Whereas discrete are typically counts, these are typically measurements of real world things like height and weight and distance and speed and so on. And let's go back and look at these previous examples really quickly and categorize them. <coughs> The experiment with the dice, the coin toss, and genetics, they're all discrete because they're counts of things, aren't they? Counts of heads, counts of number of spots on the dice, counts of number of plants with yellow pods, discrete. The coin weight, the height of a cadet, the temperature, all those are continuous. Because if you need just one little break here, you can assume infinite precision of measurement. I know that's not really possible, there's always, between any two heights, there's always another height that's possible. So those are examples of continuous. And now that we've defined those, <coughs> we're just going to focus on the screen. Okay, briefly here, a little bit of a side. I said that discrete random variables almost always have a finite number of values. They don't have to, though. They can have a countable, a countable number of values, an infinite, but it has to be countable. What's that mean? Infinite but countable? I only put this in here. If we get to the Poisson distribution, it will be an example of a discrete distribution that has a countably infinite number of values. <coughs> and in that case, countable means that I can take each of those values and put them in correspondence with the integers. I can count them, one, two, three, so on. There might not be any upper bound maximum, but I could, in theory, just keep counting and counting and assigning an integer to it. So as an example, if, I'm, if I could measure the number of photons passing through Mallory Hall at any second, that's a big number. But it's a countable number. It might not have any upper bound get really large, but it's countable, so it's discrete. I'd have 100,000 photons in that second. I could have 100,001. I can't have anything in between. All right, got that idea? If, don't worry if you, it's not real crystal clear. If we get to the <coughs> distributions, then we'll talk more about that. All right, now the second key concept, probability distributions. We talk about random variables. <coughs> the way we study random variables is by looking at their probability distribution. And for discrete random variables, we use tables and histograms primarily. For continuous random variables, we'll use functions and graphs. So in chapter six, we'll be doing uh, using these techniques. In chapter five, tables and histograms. But in either case, there are two requirements for a, for 
a distribution to be a probability distribution. That is that the prop P of X, the probability of that value of a random variable, always has to be between zero and one, inclusive. That makes sense, doesn't it? I can't have a probability less than zero or greater than one. Then the other requirement is that if I take the probabilities of each of my permitted values to random variables, and I add them all together, it has to be equal one. Because that's all the possible outcomes there are, right? There isn't anything else. So all those probabilities would have to add to one. Let's go back to the coin example again. I'm counting the number of heads in three tosses. X is my random variable. It could be zero, one, two, or three. And it can't be anything else. So the probability of it being zero plus the probability of it being one or three or two, if I add those up, it has to be one. Because that's all there is. And that's the rationale for that second requirement of the probability distribution. <coughs> add everything up, you get one. Now these tables are convenient ways to have to work with discrete probability distributions. So let's just practice a few calculations with them. It's pretty natural. If you are asked to find the probability that x is between 1 and 2 inclusive, right, that was the probability statement. How would you calculate that? So you go to the table and you find two entries, 1 and 2. I add those together and I get 6 eighths. Now I make an assumption here. Anybody catch me on this? This is really cool to saying x is e equal to 1 or x is equal to 2. Does that sound familiar? That or? In chapter 4, what rule did we use when we calculated the probabilities that had or? In that addition. The addition rule. And what is the addition rule? P of A plus P of B minus the probability of A and B. Mm -hmm. What's the probability of A or B? Well, wait, how did I get away with this not putting in this term then? <coughs> I just added those two together. I didn't subtract anything out. Mistake of my slide? Not this time. Is it because it has to be one? Uh, not exactly. You're saying that they're not overlapping. Okay, what's a more statistical term for not overlapping? Uh, it starts with this. Disjoint. Disjoint or mutually exclusive. That's one of the nice properties of these discrete random variables in the table here, each of those outcomes are mutually exclusive or disjoint, right? They have to be. Think of the procedure. I'm flipping a coin and counting the number of heads, and that number of heads is my value of the random variable. Is it possible to flip a coin three times and get two heads and three heads? No, I can't. If I get three heads, I've got three heads. I can't have two heads at the same time. I either had two heads or had three or had one or zero. They're disjoint or mutually exclusive. So I'm justified in just adding those two numbers together. And there's another example using the or, writing it a little bit different. Probability x equals zero or x equals two. Because of this property, I could just add those together right out of my probability distribution. There's a, a couple other possibilities. We might say, what's the probability if x is at least or less than 2, or at most 1, or x is less than 2? We're going to have different ways of stating the same probability question. And you need to be comfortable moving back and forth from the English, x is less than 2, to the mathematical statement and then using the table to find that probability. 
Well, that one is pretty straightforward. It's less than n. What about something x is at most? If I say at most, what does that mean? Well, it could be 2, right? If it's at most 2, it could be 2, it could be 1, or it could be 0. So at most would be less than or equal to 2. Okay, let's make that translation. At most, less than or equal to. At least, well, at least would be greater than or equal to. And then I can easily go to the table here. Oh, greater than or equal to 2. That's those two rows. Add up the probabilities, and I've got the answer. All right, let's pause here for a little reflection. And I'll let the first row have the honors today. Which of the, are these the probability distributions or not? You've got keys, example one. Is that a probability distribution? No, because? things have to be true for it to be a probability distribution. What's the first one, the easier one? All right, that was, that was actually the second one I was thinking of. All the probabilities had to add to one. And Roscoe? That was mine. That was yours too? All the probabilities have to be between zero and one. Should all those probabilities, do they add up to one? Got a little bit short, it was 0.95. He's right, that's not a probability distribution. Okay? Number two, okay, Russell. No. <coughs> sound real certain there. Well, the one on the left, what about the ones on the left? What are those things on the left column there? We have a name for them. They are. The values of the random variable. And you're troubled by the negatives and the rash or the decimals? Did we did we say anything about what the value, the random variable itself had to be? Did we make any restrictions on it? We didn't. So it's perfectly legitimate to have negative numbers here. I could have pi, I could have the square root of 17 as an x. That's no problem. That's fine. Well, the right side adds up to 1, so. Yeah. And I did this deliberately. This is to, to, miss, to get you to think about what's important here. The left column really is important. That's the value of the random variable. It's these probabilities we're focused on. They all have to be between 0 and 1, and they have to add up to B1. Uh, we'll guess number 3, please. Uh, yes. It does. All the uh, variables on the right side add up to 1. And they're all between 0 and 1. All right, right, see? Number 4. Um, no. Because? The numerical values only come out to. Yeah, this is, a, this is a bit of a gotcha. In those cases, there's going to be a lot of times you're working with probabilities and we get fractions like a third, 0.33333, and they never add up to one precisely. We'll have to round at some point. 0.9999, that's good enough. 0.95 is not. So that may really exactly. Okay, another way we can express uh, probability distributions is with a probability histogram. In this case, on the x-axis, these are values of the random variable. So I'm saying my x could be 0 through 12. In this case, the random variable. I have my bars, and the height of the bar is the probability. The probability that x is equal to 12 is, you know, maybe 0.08, something like that. It's a nice graphical representation of 
probability distribution. And human beings are pretty good at looking at graphical information and understanding what it means. For example, just looking at that, if you perform this procedure and you got the value of the random variable equal to three, would you be surprised? That Faust, would you be surprised? Yes. Why? Because there's no, there's no trigger. Yeah, almost like there's no probability. Or else it's really, really small. What values would you expect to get if you uh, do this procedure? What range of values would you see most often? <coughs> Go ahead. Unless you see 10. 10, 9 through 11. Certainly, you wouldn't see anything other than a 7 through 12 very often, would you? In fact, I'm kind of leading to something we'll talk about later. These values, 4, the 5, and maybe the 6, would be called unusual values. And that's it's going to be important later on to understand when I perform a procedure and I get a value, I need to know is this kind of reasonable? Does this happen a lot or is it unusual? And how unusual is it? Because I'll be making my decisions or my inferences based on that. Okay, finally some math, some math formulas. This is a math class. These should look familiar to you. They're on your formula sheet, so I'm not worried about you memorizing it. <coughs> For the most part, we'll be using a calculator to compute them. But let's go through them. That first symbol, what's that called? Mu. And it, it, mu is what? The average? It's a mean. Oh, it's, a mean. it's a population mean. This is or mean. And the formula is sigma x p of x. Let's just look at this a little bit. What's that Greek letter capital sigma mean? Yeah, add this stuff up. What am I adding up? Well, x is my random variable, and I'm multiplying it times the probability that I would get that value of random variable. And I'm calling that my mean or also the expectation. For our purposes, the, expect, the expected value and the mean are synonyms. And it's really just a matter of perspective or problem, but you calculate them the same way. Then we have sigma, the standard deviation, sigma squared. That's the formula. And I'm going to show you how to calculate these using the calculator next step. <coughs> I'll just give you a heads up on StatLab. When you're working some of these problems, if you ask for help, the author doesn't know you have your TI calculator. So he's going to try to be helpful and sh show you these formulas and all sorts of shortcuts as if you were adding them all up by hand. But that won't be very useful to you. Okay. How to get some exercise. Fire up those calculators. Use those batteries. I want you to put L1 the X's and L2 the P of X's. That's a probability distribution. <coughs> discrete probability distribution. You can verify that the sum of all the P of X's is equal to 1. And we're going to calculate the mean, the standard deviation, and the variance of that probability distribution. <coughs> when you finish putting those in, give me a thumbs up so I know when to proceed.
distribution to calculate <coughs> mean and standard deviation. We're going to use our own friend 1R stats. So it's stat calc on your calculator. And the very first option is 1R stats. Stat. Stat calc. Can you just press that? Just press 1R stats and then depending on your calculator you might be at the top line and it's waiting for you or you might be displayed might ask you for list, then it says freak list, and then something else. Different TI calculators versions have different responses there. You want to put in L1 and L2 as the first and second list. How do you do that? What do you have for your... It just says one more stats. Then you put in L1, comma, L2. Where are my You do have to do second, and then look for L1. <coughs> Yeah. Are we all on board here? I'm I'm sure. Sure. Uh, so you said uh, you want L1 for the L2 for the list and L2 for the list? Yeah. <coughs> and when you've done that, then the output of one of our stats, <coughs> X bar will be the mean. The TI calls the X bar is the mean. And what S of X is the standard deviation. And that's those are the answers you should get. 5 and 1.584. And if I wanted to know the variance of that distribution, what would I do? Hmm? How would I get the variance of that distribution? What is the variance? Did you square it? You square it. The variance is the sigma squared. The standard e deviation is the square of the variance. So <coughs> the variance. Your TI calculator doesn't give you sigma squared, but it gives you sigma. So just take it and square it. If you variance. Good to go. And the expected values, I said, we're going to treat it as a synonym for the mean. There'll be some problems where you're asked, find the expected value, same as finding the mean. All right, that's where I'm going to break for today. Just to one comment here. I think I mentioned this before. To the extent you can, try to stay in your seats during the lecture. We are trying to have a film in here. If things are urgent, take care of them. If you can, take care of things before class. It sounds like there's a various plague moving around here that's making it more challenging. I understand.